Hi everybody, this is Mr. Nolan, uh, and I just uh, want to run through what we've talked about for the last couple of days in order to give um, you, know, you a sense of what are we trying to do here. So in uh, previous videos, uh, we've discussed antibiotic resistance in bacteria. Now if you are not familiar with that model, if you have missed that you know, portion of the class, or if you really don't know how to do that model, you really have to go back and watch uh, my video it's in the description of of this video um, click that link so that you can actually go and watch that antibiotic resistance model before you continue and watch this because this will make a lot more sense if you understand that model um, also if you're watching this video you ought to have a, a document in front of you um, I'll show you what it looks like it looks like this uh, extending our antibiotic resistance model to other organisms so this is what this uh, handout looks like and you need this in front of you in order to make uh, in order to do the work and make sense out of what these scenarios are that we're going to look at. So if you have not read the scenarios in that document that I just showed you, please go here to this link for the document. It's also in the description of this video. And read the scenarios. So do the first page, read the scenarios. That way you understand the background behind these scenarios. As I'm talking about them, I'm going to be very, very brief because I'm assuming that you've already read the scenarios. So please do that at this moment. Pause the video, read those scenarios, and then we'll talk about what we're going to do from there. So our agenda today is to extend our antibiotic resistance model to other organisms. That's our goal. We want to be able to do that. Um, our antibiotic resistance model doesn't just work for bacteria. We can kind of use this for other situations as well. So there's four scenarios that we're going to look at, four different situations, one involving apples, triggerfish, uh, hummingbirds, and then different color flowers. So we're going to run through these four scenarios just to kind of say, how, how does that model, the antibiotic resistance model, how is that in play with these four different scenarios? So let's start with apples. So apples, there's some background to apples. Um, you know, for the sake of the scenario, we're assuming that, okay, there's thousands of years ago, there's two kinds of apples. There's tart apples, and then there's mild apples. Tart means sour, mild means sweet. And uh, people are eating the apples, and when they throw the apples, you know, the cores, they grow more apple trees. So if we start with a population of apples where with, with that has tart apples and mild apples, what's going to happen over time if people are involved? So let's use this blank space, and we're going to go ahead and model out what do we think ought to happen here? So I'll start us off with a population of, of mild and tart apples mixed together. So here's our scenario to start with. We've got our original population here. We've got a roughly even uh, mixture of mild apples and tart apples. Mild are sweet and the tart ones are kind of sour. We've got humans around here. And what it says in the scenario is that humans are going to choose a certain apple to eat them and then throw the core. Now when a human does that to one of these apples, um, that's actually going to result in more reproduction for that apple. So let's kind of start to model this out and show how, how should we think about this. So the humans are going to choose certain apples to eat. And when they eat those apples and throw the cores, it's those apples that are going to reproduce. That's what the scenario says. So what we would probably expect to see is that over time, we're going to have a lot more mild apples whole lot of mild apples. I'm just going to draw them in red instead of labeling them. And we're probably going to have a lot fewer of the tart ones. And that's because people are eating more of the mild apples, and so these tart ones are going to die off. Now, don't forget that the reason why we have these different traits is because the mild apples have a mild gene, and the tart apples have a tart gene. So over the course of time, the humans are going to cause an increase in the mild gene and a decrease in the tart gene. So in the end, we're going to end up with a lot more mild genes and a lot less tart genes, these green ones. We see we've identified those, green, those genes. So this works very similar to our antibacterial uh, or antibiotic uh, bacteria model. Um, let's extend this to another one. Let's look at another model involving some fish. So triggerfish. In this scenario, we've got this population of fish, these triggerfish, and they are living in, in a colorful coral reef, and triggerfish are generally pretty colorful, but there's some drab ones hidden in this population. And there's also rays, there's predators, and they eat the fish they're able to see. So this one's kind of complicated, so, so this can get complicated, so let's kind of see how this model would work. Okay, so I've sort of set up our population. This is our population, right? We've got our colorful fish, and they have the colorful gene. And we also have some drab fish, and they have the drab gene. Now, the reef is really colorful. So 
if we're looking at the situation and trying to think logically about well, what's going to happen here, well, we have a predator, and the ray hunts by sight. So the ray is probably going to pick off the drab fish in this situation, right? It's going to eat the drab fish because those don't really blend in. My colorful fish will actually blend in against the reef. But this is changing, right? We actually have a changing situation here. So we see some time has passed and our reef is bleaching, right? It's becoming drab. So when that happens, that's really bad news for the colorful fish because now you can see they are very visible against that drab reef. So our predator, our ray, is now going to be able to catch those colorful fish and eat them. So those colorful fish are now in a really bad situation because the background has changed. So if we go ahead and if we extend the, the time, if we consider reproduction, what's going to happen here over time? So over time, what we're going to find is that these fish have an edge. The drab fish can blend into that reef, unlike before, the colorful fish could blend into the reef. And so now when we have reproduction, we have the uh, replication of the drab gene. That's what we really have. Just like the apples, we have a huge increase in that kind of gene. Some of the colorful ones might survive, but in general, we're going to have a lot more of this gene. Let's keep going and we'll look at some other examples. We'll look at two more examples in which we see this, this way that the population changes. So scenario uh, C, we have hummingbirds. So hummingbirds are really, really interesting creatures, and they have very, very specifically shaped beaks to fit very specifically shaped flowers. And so in this scenario, what we learn, what we see, is that there's the, all these flowers, and there's uh, three kinds of hummingbirds, long, medium, and short-beaked hummingbirds, and uh, the short and medium flowers all die. And so the question now is, how does this population of hummingbirds change? So let's go ahead. I'll set up that population. We'll see what happens. So when we start out the scenario, we can assume that we've got kind of roughly equal numbers of these different kinds of hummingbirds. These are all the same species. They're just different individuals in this population. We've got long beak hummingbirds with the long gene, medium beak birds with the medium gene, and then sh uh, short birds, the green ones here, with the short gene. We've also got long, medium, and short flowers. Well, in our scenario, the medium and short flowers all die. And so over time, what we're going to find is that, oh no, there's only long flowers left. So let's indicate that. So we've got a pretty bad situation for some of our, uh, of our hummingbirds. The short beak hummingbirds can't get their beak all the way down to the bottom of the flower to get the nectar, because that's what hummingbirds use flowers for. They drink their nectar and they get food from it. The medium ones can't really fit their beaks in very well either. But our long beak hummingbirds are actually able to put that beak in there, and they can actually drink from the flower. One thing I want to mention before you get confused, we're not really given a very good reason why the flowers die. The important reason is that only the long ones are left, right? We're really not interested in the population of flowers. We're interested in the population of the hummingbirds. So if we think about this, well, who's going to have a rough time? It's these ones. These ones are the hummingbirds that are going to die. So if we think about how reproduction is going to occur, well, reproduction, we're going to have our long beak hummingbirds. These ones are going to reproduce more, a lot more, than the other ones. Again, you might have a couple of maybe some medium beak ones survive, but they're not going to be very happy. So this is how we see this population changing. We see that the long gene is what's going to persist in that population. That's because of the environment. Because we've got all these long flowers, we don't have any medium or short ones for the medium or short hummingbirds to get their food from. So this is just another example of how is this population going to change as a result of the environment changing. So let's go ahead and look at one more example. Uh, this one's probably the most complicated, but you might think that it's pretty easy. It has to do with uh, bees. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, so in this last example, we've got a situation with honeybees, and then we have flowers. The honeybees are on an island. There's all different colors of flower. There's red, pink, blue, and yellow. But it turns out that this breed of honeybee only likes yellow. That's, that's her color. She likes yellow. So um, honeybees will pollinate flowers, and that's what helps flowers to reproduce. And so let's see what happens to this situation if uh, you know our honeybees like the color yellow. Let's go ahead and set up this population. So according to this scenario, our bee likes yellow, and we have this big mixed combina uh, population of genes. We've got yellow genes, we've got red genes, we've got purple genes, we've got blue genes. I know the colors don't really match up, but 
just the, uh, that's why I put letters by them. So we've got all this big mix of genes in the same species, but the bee really only likes yellow. So what's going to happen over time? The bee is going to help those yellow flowers to uh, pollinate and reproduce. So what are we going to see happen to this population over here? So it's reasonable to assume here that the honeybee is going to go after the yellow flowers. That's going to help that flower to reproduce. And we're probably going to see that these other flowers decrease in number. They're, they're just not able to compete with that yellow flower. So we're going to see their numbers kind of go down. And so over time, we're going to have reproduction, which I'll keep that REP for short. And so what we'll end up having is that these yellow flowers, remember black is yellow, these yellow flowers are probably going to reproduce a lot faster than those other color flowers because those other color flowers don't have the advantage of the bee. Again, there might be a couple of red ones. There might be a couple of blue ones hidden in here. There might be a couple of pink ones, which in this example is green. So you might have some of those other flowers surviving. But really the important thing is that you're going to have a huge increase in the yellow gene whereas these other genes are probably going to decrease. So again, what we can see is that in this original population, we've got kind of equal numbers. That's not always going to be the case, but in most of these cases, we've got kind of equal numbers. The yellow bee, or the, I'm sorry, the bee that likes yellow gives those yellow flowers an advantage. So those flowers over time are going to not just survive, but reproduce more. It's kind of like the apple example or from earlier, where you know the honeybee is doing a little bit like what the people do. right? The people are helping the apple to reproduce. In this case, the bee is helping this certain kind of flower to reproduce. So once again, we're going to end up with an increase in this gene. So what we're going to do uh, in the future is start talking about what is it that makes a gene good? Um, it, is it, you know, is it that we like it? Is it that it's pretty? Or what is it about a gene that makes it a good thing? You know, so um, this should hopefully give you some food for thought to, to think about um, why do certain populations change over time. In the next video, we're going to start to try to figure out what are those principles? What exactly are those principles behind uh, a, a population changing over time? Why does that happen? So stay tuned for another up, uh, upload, and uh, I will see you then.